So good morning, everyone. Actually, here it's here it's evening. So uh, uh, hopefully, I'll be awake enough. Um, what I want to talk about today are some first general ideas on how we could integrate models into deep learning, and then we'll see specific applications uh, to super resolution. So let me say before I start, um, I, I hope it's possible. I don't know exactly what the setup is there, but I'm super happy for people to ask questions throughout the talk. So if if that's okay on your end, then I'm, I'm really happy to do that because I think, you know, the point is uh, for me to be interactive so that people kind of feel like they're following uh, the main ideas and thoughts. So do feel free to reach out uh, with questions and any, anybody who's online, of course, on, over Zoom, just unmute yourself and ask. Uh, so no problem there. So what, what I want to talk about is, you know, we're obviously we're in the era of deep learning, but we also have many, many good algorithms that have been used, you know, for decades uh, based on on models. And the question is really if we can integrate the two, and that's really what we're going to talk about. And then, of course, see applications uh, to super resolution. So, you know, obviously for this audience, we don't have to motivate uh, deep learning. You know, we're, we're in the era of the deep learning revolution. We see deep learning being used in many, many applications. But actually, if we look where it's used in practice, and of course, you could find papers about anything, but the question is, where does it really have an impact and where has it really been employed in practice? So these are actually mainly in areas of computer vision and speech processing. And these are problems that were really hard to tackle before when we relied on kind of more conventional optimization tools. So basically, deep learning has been most successful in areas where we didn't really have good methods before. But of course, many of the areas that we're interested in, and super resolution is one of them, do have good techniques and good modeling. So the question is how we leverage that. So of course, we know that with deep learning, we could do you know amazing things. We could get amazing empirical success. We could do things like spawn fake faces. I don't really know why you want to do that, but you know that's one of the examples that people always bring. But of course, we could do also many, many useful things, like we could get very good uh, classification error rates, et cetera, et cetera. But this also comes at a price. So we know that in order to get these good results, we have to have really, really large training sets. The computational cost um, can be very high. We know that the methods are not necessarily interpretable, so we get a result, but it's very hard typically to explain why we got the result. And we also know that very often these methods are not very robust and don't generalize well. So, you know, we work a lot, particularly in our lab in, in medical imaging, and there, you know, we, we see it all the time that we could train on even a large data set from one hospital, but then when you apply the results to a different hospital, although presumably they're using the same machine and the same technique, um, you know, it doesn't work so well anymore. So these issues are very important, especially when we're talking about things like medical imaging or things like scientific discovery, where we don't have a ground truth, right? I mean, we don't really know if we made a good decision or not. So having some form of reliability and interpretability uh, becomes very, very important. Now, on the other hand, if we look at, you know, more traditional areas of, of signal processing, optimization, image processing, in, in these areas, traditionally, we relied on models. So the nice thing about models is that obviously it gives us a principal way to tackle the problem. We can nicely incorporate anything we know about the problem. We can incorporate structure. Typically, we could get results from very small amounts of data. We don't need large data sets, sets in order to get good results. And we also know that we have very nice analytical techniques in order to assess the quality of the output. So if we want to know how well we're doing or what are areas where we may have to be cautious, we typically have tools to do that when we're relying on models. But of course, the disadvantage is that we have to have a good model. So if our model is not exact or if there's parts that we don't know how to model well, then this will affect our performance. And the inference itself could be very slow. So these are kind of the things that we typically try to overcome when we turn to deep networks. And what we've been looking at in our work in the past few years has been, how could we combine the two, basically get the best of both worlds? So we want to use the power of learning, but also incorporate models. And again, this is really important in areas that are, I would say, more, let's say, man-made systems that we could describe. And of course, microscopy is, is definitely one of them. So to see how we would merge the two, let's say kind of a bird's eye view to how we used to solve things with signal processing. So in a standard signal processing problem, you'll start with some input to the system. We're gonna call it Y, it's a measurement, let's say. We have some desired output. So Y could be 
you know, our, our blurry image and X could be the super resolved image. And the way we would typically do this is that we would start with some model. So we would assume that we could describe our data Y as some function, known function of X. And maybe we also have some regularizers on X. And then we'd set up an optimization problem. So we have some metric that we want to optimize. For example, it could be the norm of the difference between our model G of X and Y. We could add some regularization terms. So we have some metric function that is presumably capturing how well we can do in this problem. And it's also capturing the model, right? Because this model G of X, of course, figures heavily within this metric. And then we could go ahead and use our favorite optimization solver to try and solve this problem. So for example, if we use some sort of gradient method, what it will typically boil down to is that we have some pre-processing, we have some post-processing, and then in between, we're going to have iterations um, that are coming from our algorithm. And typically those iterations, we could also break down to two steps where one is gonna be a more generic computation, and then the other is going to be something that actually depends on the model, on that G of X that we assumed. So this is kind of, you know, the standard approach to look at model-based uh, networks. Now, on the other hand, if we look at deep learning, of course, the situation is very, very different. So in deep learning or in, in supervised deep learning, we assume that we have paired data. So we have many, many inputs matched to many, many outputs. We have some fixed architecture that we decide on in advance. And this architecture is not really related closely to our problem. So it could be, you know, a UNet, a ResNet. But these are all fixed architectures. They're not incorporating knowledge about our specific problem. And then what we do is we use our training data to train the weights in this network so that when a new input comes in, we hope that it will give us the desired output. So clearly these are two very, very different approaches. And the question is, you know, how we could combine them or how we can merge them. And in our work, we've been looking at two main approaches. One is an approach that is what we call unfolding or enrolling. And, and we'll say more about that on the next slide, but it basically results from this optimization point of view, where we use the layers of the optimization to define the actual network. The other is a more plug-in approach, where we actually perform the inference using our algorithm. And whenever there's something that depends on the model, we just substitute a network only to learn that particular block. So just to go into a little bit more detail about these two methods, and then, of course, we'll go ahead and, and look at applications. So the first method of unfolding or enrolling dates back to a really beautiful paper of Gregor and Lacoon, where they looked at this method for sparse recovery problems. And in recent years, there's been a lot of extensions. Those of you interested, we have a recent review uh, for the signal processing that algorithm magazine, sorry, that we wrote about this uh, method. So the idea on unfolding is that you start with your optimization algorithm, like we've seen before, and you write down a fixed number of iterations of this algorithm. So here we have, you know, T steps of the algorithm. Now this is just implementing an iterative algorithm, but rather than using, you know, 10,000 steps, we're only using, let's say 10 steps. So if we did that, we'd actually get an output that's not so good. But then the important thing is the last step. So in this last step, we free some of these parameters. So in these iterations, there's going to be parameters that come from our model. And instead of assuming that those are known, we're going to learn those from training data. So at the end, we have a network. It's typically not going to be so deep, so we'll typically have something like 10 layers, but it is a network, so we're going to do the inference using a network. But the layers in this network are actually coming from our optimization solver that is trained with training data. Okay, so hopefully kind of that idea is clear. The second approach is a more plug-in approach where the inference is done with the actual algorithm. So think, for example, of let's say a dynamic programming algorithm where Within the dynamic programming, we may have steps that depend on our model. And what we're going to do is whenever we have a step that depends on that on the model, in that particular step, we're going to use instead a network. So in this case, the inference is actually done with an algorithm, not with a deep network. And the deep network is only used within the overall algorithm to learn very, very specific blocks. OK, so we have some reviews on this as well. The, this, in our particular work, this we've used primarily in different communication problems where there's very um, well-known good heuristics like the Viterbi algorithm that's based on dynamic programming. Whereas the first approach we used more with where optimization is the underlying tool like in super resolution. 
So just to kind of put those ideas together before we start going into the details, so basically we could think of kind of two extremes of processing of data. On the one hand, we have, you know, purely data-driven techniques, which are, you know, various forms of deep networks. On the other hand, we have purely model-based methods, which are typically based on a model and an optimization algorithm. And both of them are trying to do the same thing, right? Like they get an input and they want to infer an output. And what we would like is to find some middle ground, right? We want to mix them, mix and match. So typical examples of model-based methods are, let's say, the Viterbi algorithm, which is a dynamic programming approach to solve the maximum likelihood detection problem, or sparse recovery problems that are used in many, many different imaging problems and super resolution problems. And then, of course, both of these have, you know, versions that are learned. So, you know, there's by now hundreds of papers that look at how you could do symbol detection using a deep network. And of course, they have nothing to do with the Viterbi algorithm. And there's, there's you know, thousands of papers that look at how you could do, for example, image recovery, and they have nothing to do necessarily with sparse recovery. So these are kind of the two extremes. And what we want to do is combine them. And we can combine them, as we showed before, in two main ways. One is by using, let's say, sparse recovery and unfolding it to an optimization solver. And this gives us this list approach, which is the unfolding approach. And the other is a plugin approach where we keep the underlying algorithm, but any place there's something we don't know, we use a network. And that leads, for example, to what we call the Viterbi net, which is a network version of the Viterbi algorithm. So these two kind of edges represent two different ways that we end up combining them. In the first, we're actually inferring using a deep network in unfolding, but we integrate the model-based method into the architecture of the deep network. Whereas in the second, the inference is actually not done with a network. It's done with a model-based algorithm, but we augment the algorithm with the network anytime there's something that we don't know. Okay, so these are kind of basically the two approaches. I hope they're clear. We have a recent review paper where we describe them, and we also have two recent books that use these, one in machine learning and wireless, where we focus on communication applications, and the other is uh, AI for COVID-19, where we focus more on medical applications, and they go into more detail on these model-based methods. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. I'll, I'll describe the outline and then I'll pause to see if there were any questions. But what we're going to do in the rest of the talk is mainly focus on the unfolding because that's really what we used for super resolution. So that's going to be the main focus of the talk. We'll talk about how we could do unfolding for general, general sparse recovery, which we, will be the basis of what we do for super resolution. We'll then talk about general applications in imaging and ultrasound, and then we'll move on to talk about uh, specific applications in super resolution in both optics and ultrasound. And I'll say a little bit about theoretical results um, at the end. So hopefully the main idea is clear, but before I kind of continue with the details, let me just pause and see if there is if if there is an option of asking if uh, there's any questions so far. Yeah, <coughs> there's nothing online at the moment. Does anyone have in the audience, anyone have a question at this point? No, I think, I think we, can, we, we crack on then. Okay, good. So I think everybody's good and awake early in the morning. Great. Okay, so let me let me kind of show how this unfolding works for sparse recovery. And then, of course, we're going to generalize it further uh, to super resolution. So in general, like I said, the idea behind unfolding is to take our iterative algorithm, write it down um, a fixed number of times. And then instead of keeping the parameters fixed, we actually learn them from data. So let's take a look at the sparse recovery problem, which is the basis for many super resolution techniques. So in the sparse recovery problem, we assume that our data could be written as a linear transform of the unknown vector x. And we assume that x is sparse. OK, so a typical way of solving this problem is to look at in, an objective that's a combination of a least squares error. We want to best fit our data y and we add a regularizer to model the sparsity in X. And this is the basis of, of course, many compressed sensing algorithms, but also of many super resolution methods. So if you were trying to solve this using, you know, your favorite proximal gradient solver, what each iteration would look like is something like this. So you have a gradient step, and that's represented by these two green blocks. This just represents the gradient with an appropriate step size. And then you have a projection onto the L1 ball which leads to this soft thresholding operation. And this is known as the ISTA algorithm, iterative shrinkage and thresholding, which does, you know, let's say 10,000 iterations of this form, and that will end up giving you your sparse recovered X. So that's what ISTA would look like. Now, of course, if you're implementing ISTA, first of all, you would need many, many iterations. 
And moreover, and maybe more important for our purposes, you have to know the forward mat matrix exactly, right? You have to know A. And of course, you have to have a good choice of the step size and of the threshold parameter. And all of these highly affect the performance. Now, what if this is modeling, you know, a super resolution problem? So A would be, would represent the PSF of the system. And you may not know the PSF exactly, or maybe you estimated it, but you don't have a very good approximation of the PSF. And also determining the threshold value and the step size is not easy if you don't have ground truth data, which you don't normally have in super resolution. So instead of keeping those parameters fixed, what we could do is we could unfold the algorithm. So we write down let's say 10 steps of ISTA. But now instead of keeping all of these parameters fixed, we now learn them from data. So we could learn the parameter of lambda and note also that they're different here in each layer. We could also learn these linear blocks. So instead of assuming that we know A and that we know A transpose A, we can make these arbitrary and learn them. We could have make them structured if we want to, for example, if we're approximating a PSF, then we would probably want to make these convolutional layers. But we're learning them from data rather than assuming that they're fixed. And this is really the basic idea behind the LISTA algorithm, learned ISTA. So the nice thing is that it gives us a very simple interpretable method. It works very well. It doesn't have a lot of parameters. And of course, it has low complexity and low memory because there's not many parameters. But what's also nice is because once it's formulated as an optimization problem, we can now use different optimization tools to try and extend it. So for example, if our data is not all taken from the same PSF, let's say we have several PSFs, or there's error in the PSF, but the error is different from sample to sample, then we can look at a generalization of robust least squares. So rather than solving a least squares problem and getting Lista, we could now look at robust least squares where we add for where we allow for more uncertainty. And this is a well-known optimization problem. So if you tried to solve this as just an optimization problem, you would get this problem. So it's actually very similar to the least squares problem we had before, but it has an extra normalization. And this just comes from adding an error on the forward matrix. You get this extra normalization. But then if you do proximal gradient, you get two additional terms that comes from this denominator. And now if you unfold this, you'll get a robust network that will give us much better results and generalize much better. But the nice thing is that we didn't have to guess, right? It would be very hard to guess a network of this form. I mean, there's no reason why you would guess this form of a network. But here we didn't guess it. It just, we got it automatically from using robust optimization tools. So once we formulate the problem within an optimization setting, we could use various generalizations of optimization and they will naturally lead to different properties of the network that we don't have to guess, but we get them automatically um, from following this principle. Okay, so let me go ahead now and show some applications to imaging in general, and then we'll move on to super resolution. So one of the first applications we looked at is a super well-studied problem, and this was done together with Professor Vishal Monga and his team. And here we just looked at the basic deep blurring problem. So we have, you know, some unknown X, we view it through a blur, blur kernel, and we have noise. So here we have to do both super resolution and denoising at the same time. And we don't know the blur, blur kernel, and we have no estimate of it. Now, of course, there's been, you know, literally thousands of deep learning paper papers on how to solve this problem. So what we wanted to do is use a very, very simple optimization approach and see, you know, how well we can do. So what we did is we set this up as an optimization problem, a least square is regularized problem. We're here, what we're searching for are the Gs are representing features of the image. So we're looking at features of the image that if we can involve them with this unknown blur, we'll get matching features of the observed image. Okay, so this is just a least squares formulation where we add an L1 term on the features. We're assuming the features are sparse and we add an L2 norm on the blur. So we're assuming that the blue blur is norm bounded. Okay, so super simple optimization. And then we just use a variable splitting approach like an ADMM approach um, in order to solve this problem. And then we unfolded it. So we just wrote down, you know, 10 steps, estimated, um, the unknown parameters from training data. And this led to this particular network, which again, is not a structure you would have just guessed, but it follows from the optimization. And what's really cool is that it led to really, really good results. So our method is, is Dublin, and we compare it here to, you know, the ground truth and to state-of-the-art deep learning methods, which are, of course, much more complicated, have many parameters and, you know, have been tuned uh, skillfully 
over various different data sets. And here, Dublin, we just took kind of off the shelf, as I just explained, from optimization. And you can see both in terms of quantitative measures, but also qualitatively, if you look, the, the, these are the, the image and what we get from the different techniques, and these are kind of zoom-ins. And you see from the zoom-ins that we get much better contrast, much better resolution, um, even though we're using a super simple network. Okay, so just something we derived from an optimization solver. Now, in what we just did, we assumed kind of fixed regularizers, right? We used an L1 regularizer on, on the features, and we used an L2 uh, regularizer on the blur. But sometimes you may not know, you know, what the correct regularizer is. So you might have some underlying image, which is kind of complicated to describe. So the next step was to also learn the regularizer. So rather than assuming that the regularizer is fixed, what we did is we, we modeled the regularizer as an unknown PDF, an unknown prior, and then we learned the prior together with learning the um, underlying other parameters like the PSF. So this was work that was done together with Professor Ruth Van Sloan and Danielle Friedman from Google. And what we show here is that by using this approach of also unfolding the prior, we could tackle much more difficult imaging problems. So here you see, for example, these are the uh, clean images. These are the images that are corrupted in different ways. So here we have very heavy noise. Here we have an in-painting problem where we basically just remove part of the image. Here we have heavy de-blurring, heavy blurring. And we see that again, using this very simple optimization where we also learn the prior, we could get very good results. Again, better results than state of the art in the literature, even though our method is much simpler and has f much fewer parameters and it's also interpretable. So we know kind of exactly um, what we're doing. Okay, so that was a little bit about how we could apply these, these ideas in imaging. Um, what I want to show next is how we can apply this in medical imaging. And here, you know, we go kind of beyond what we showed until now. So one of the problems that we have in ultrasound imaging, and ultrasound is something that we've been working on a lot in our labs, is signal separation. So what, what ends up happening is that what we get if we're trying to take, let's say, a blood flow, uh, using ultrasound for blood flow, is that the blood is masked by strong reflections from the tissue. So what you see over here, this is after we did separation. So here you see the tissue and you see that it's very, very strong background, although we're not actually interested in the tissue. And here you see the blood flow, which is very sparse. But if you view them together, all you basically see is the tissue. You don't actually see the blood flow. So we want to separate the blood flow from the tissue. And the way it's done today is by using PCA or SVD, okay, just principal component analysis. But that's really not sophisticated enough, as you can see here, uh, as you can see here, to do the separation. So what we did instead is we said, okay, let's model the signal as low rank plus far. So the low rank models the tissue background because it's not changing from frame to frame. And the blood flow we're going to model as being sparse because it flows, but it is sparse with an image. And if we use the low rank plus sparse, we get better results than SVD, but it's still not good enough, right? Because the model isn't exact. So the next thing we did was trying to do unfolding to this low rank plus sparse model. So we set up a problem as here's, this is all real data. So here's the data. We're going to model it as low rank plus sparse. We have a low rank regularizer on the low rank part. We have a sparsity regularizer on the sparse part. And then again, we use our favorite proximal gradient scheme, which gives us these iterations. And if you run these iterations long enough, then you'll get the low rank plus sparse decomposition we saw before. But that really wasn't powerful enough. Um, it did a better job than SVD, but not didn't give us a, a good enough separation. But now what we're going to do is we're going to unfold it. Okay, so we write it down as a layer in the network, and then we learn the parameters from data. And again, what's nice is that it gives you this very interesting type of a network that you wouldn't guess, right? This network has two inputs that are kind of intertwined, and it has two different nonlinearities, one coming from the soft thresholding, one coming from the thresholding on the eigenvalues. So this is not a structure that you would see in the literature, but it is a structure that's tailored to our specific problem. And this is real data, so you see that if you put in the real data into these 10 layers that are basically solving this low rank plus sparse, you get very good separation, much better than what we've seen before. Okay, so it works very well for signal separation. We've used the same techniques in other areas of signal separation. So we've used this in radar. We've used the, we've used this in different imaging applications where, um, where images are, are kind of cluttered uh, by strong reflectors. Um, so that's kind of one use of these ideas. The other area in medical imaging where we've been using this is actually in um, 
in building the ultrasound device. So ultrasound devices today are, are very big. And the reason is that they have to acquire a lot of data. So the ultrasound probe um, has many, many elements, many antenna elements in it, typically about 128 elements. And each one of those elements has to be sampled and processed to form the image. And that's very costly. So you can't do that today within the probe. You do it within the machine. But using these techniques of unfolding, we were able to drastically reduce the sampling rates so that now the sampling is done within the probe. And therefore, what comes out of the probe is are just bits that we could send over any channel. We could do the recovery. We don't we no longer need a machine. We could do the recovery on on a tablet, on an iPhone or in some remote processing. So if the doctor is sitting somewhere else in the world, you know, we could send the bits to wherever he's sitting. And therefore, this enables us instead of having a big machine, we just get a simple probe and a, some sort of device in order to see the image. Um, the other nice thing is that we actually get the raw data itself. In standard ultrasound machines, all you have access to is the image. But here we have access to the data, so we can now try and come up with new methods to apply on the data to get things beyond what you can see today in ultrasound imaging. Hello, so this is a short demo uh, of the device you. that we've developed. This is Dr. Shai Taiman Yelden, a cardiologist that we're working with, and he's scanning my uh, former student, I guess. Okay, so here the data is going directly from the probe to a local machine, to a remote machine, and to the tablet. On the right atrium, we can see the different structures of the heart. We can see the mitral valve and the protested valve. We can see the nice motion of the leaflets. We can see that actually there is a third ventricular function and there is no pericardial effusion. The picture itself is very good, very crisp, and we can demonstrate very nicely uh, this subject. Okay, so here he's scanning directly to the tablet. And as I said, a nice benefit of this is that we actually have access to the bits themselves, um, and therefore we could create um, higher resolution and higher contrast images by performing deep learning on the bits themselves and not just on the image that already comes out of the machine. And we've been, uh, we have a large clinical study that we're doing with Bailington Hospital where we started applying these techniques um, to different uh, cancer patients to get um, better imaging in the ultrasound device. Now, like I said, a nice aspect of this is that now that we have access to the bits themselves, we can apply interesting new algorithms not only to form an image, but also to get quantitative imaging. So here, for example, we've applied um, um, methods coming from physics, from wave equations, to try and perform inverse ultrasound and get quantitative parameters, not just an image. So here you see, for example, the extraction of speed of sound within the image by applying model-based learning on the data. And in this BMOD image, you can see that, you know, there's areas that are black, which are indicative of a lesion, but you can see within the lesion. Whereas here, after you perform the speed of sound, you could kind of see clearly that there's a lesion in this area because the, the wave behaves very differently in that area. And this is enabled by the fact that we could do model-based learning on the data and extract those model parameters. We've also been using this a lot in, in different COVID applications. So we use this to get model-based networks for COVID detection from X-ray and ultrasound. And uh, we have a large group of hospitals that we've been working with in Israel on this. And we were able to get very good results so over 90% uh, detection, even though we had very small training sets. So that's, again, another power of the model-based approach is that it doesn't need large training sets in order to learn. And we've done the same thing in ultrasound as well. Okay, so that was hopefully gave you a background for how this unfolding works, how we could use it in different applications. And what I want to do next is turn to super resolution and see how we use these more specifically in the context of super resolution, both in microscopy and in ultrasound. So, okay, clearly to this audience, you know, we don't need to motivate uh, super resolution in microscopy. So as we all know, the, 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 the problem is we're limited by physics, right? We can see below uh, the diffraction limit, which is half the wavelength we're using for illumination. So in the optical regime, you know, we could see cells and bacteria, but it's very hard to see proteins and small molecules. And in 2014, the Nobel Prize went to this uh, very clever idea of super resolution optical fluorescence microscopy, where oversimplifying, but in a nutshell, the idea is that we inject fluorophores, and then we control the fluorescent so that instead of taking one high resolution image, we're now going to take, you know, thousands of thousands of images of exposures where in each exposure, only a small number of fluorophores are actually fluorescing. 
And therefore, if I have, you know, if I have an image and there's only three green spots, then I could just go ahead and localize those three green spots, stick a Gaussian every time I see a green spot. And then if I sum over all of the exposures, I'm going to get one super resolved image. So this is the idea behind uh, super resolution fluorescence microscopy. It's, it's a very, very good idea. And that's why it won the Nobel Prize. Um, and it really allows us to get very good spatial resolution. But the thing is that it gets spatial resolution at the expense of temporal resolution, because now to get one image, I need thousands of exposures. And all of those exposures, of course, I'm assuming that the cell is not moving, right? So it really precludes live cell imaging. So the question we kind of set out to answer is, could we get the best of both worlds? Could I get both good spatial resolution, but also good time resolution? So in order to do that, the first step we took, and this is work from a few years ago that we did with Professor Montesegov's group at the Technion. So the first step was to see if we could use these ideas of sparse recovery in a model-based fashion, this is before learning, in order to get super resolution. So we basically want to exploit structure, we want to exploit sparsity, but instead of exploiting sparsity in the image, which would require a small density of fluorophores, we're going to exploit structure in the correlation domain. And the reason why this is very useful is that we can take a small number of images where each one of them has a high density of fluorophores, and therefore, you know, we can finish very quickly and get time resolution. But then what we're going to exploit to get sparsity is the fact that the fluorophore blinking in different pixels is independent. And because it's independent in the correlation domain, we will naturally have sparsity. Okay, so I'll explain this all in a little bit more detail. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that our image consists of a small number of spots that go through the system PSF. Okay, and of course, if we agree with this model, then we could write it in vector form. So we could vectorize the image so that our received image looks like a sparse vector, which indicates the points where there's something in the image. And this, this sparse vector is going through the system PSF. Okay, so basically, this matrix A is representing a dictionary of all possible shifts of our PSF, and S is representing a sparse vector where each element is the position of the floor of four. Okay, and if we could recover the support of S, if we know where the floor of fours are, then we're basically recovering the underlying image. Okay, so this is kind of where the sparsity comes into play. But now what we're going to do is we're going to rely on the fact that the uh, fluorophores blink in an independent fashion so that if we look at the correlation function of these underlying fluorophores, it will be diagonal, right? Because it's if it fluoresces in an independent fashion. And furthermore, the diagonal itself is going to be sparse because we only have a small number of fluorophores. So we get double sparsity here. We have sparsity coming from the independence between the fluorophores, and we have sparsity along the diagonal that's coming from the sparse placement of the fluorophores. But because we have sparsity coming just from the blinking, the diagonal itself doesn't have to be that sparse. We could recover even if it's not very sparse, and therefore we could use a small number of exposures where in each exposure there's a large number of fluorophores or a relatively large number of fluorophores. Okay, so what the method does is it computes the correlation of the data, and from the correlation of the data, it tries to recover the correlation of the underlying image, the underlying fluorophores, but it exploits the fact that the fluorophore matrix is sparse. Okay, so hopefully that's clear, and that's how we set this up as a sparse recovery problem in the correlation domain. Okay, and this is what led to, as we're doing the super resolution in the correlation domain, and of course we use sparse recovery techniques in order to find the underlying correlation and the underlying image, and you can see over here, these are results of Sparkum. This is um, true experimental data, and this is simulated data. So you can see that we get very, very good resolution. In fact, we get even better resolution than what we get from STORM, the method behind the Nobel Prize. Um, but the nice thing is that we can do it using two orders of magnitude less data. Okay, so instead of having, you know, thousands and thousands of frames like we have in STORM, we could use only, you know, hundreds of frames and still get better resolution. Okay, so this gives us both very good spatial resolution and good time resolution. Okay, so this was good and encouraging. Where's the problem? Why do we need learning? So 
The difficulty is that we still have to tune hyperparameters here, okay? So to get these results, there's some tuning, and we also have to estimate the underlying PSF, okay? So these could be challenges in practice, and therefore it's natural to see if we use unfolding, if we could kind of overcome these challenges, and this is what we did uh, next. So this is kind of recent work that we call LSPARCOM, Learn Sparkum, where we performed unfolding on the Sparkum method. And this gives us, you know, even better performance than we got with Sparkum. But the nice thing is that we don't have to know anything. So it doesn't require any prior knowledge. We don't have to estimate the PSF. We don't have to tune hyperparameters. And it's also very fast, okay? The recovery is done very fast because it's a learned method. But because we're doing unfolding, we still have an interpretable method. And all of the training here was done on a single input-output pair, okay? So the training data is minimal. We don't need to have um, a lot of training data. So more recently, we started a collaboration with a group of Professor Gilad Aran at the Weizmann Institute, where we wanted to see if we can now use these ideas in practice for live cell imaging. Because like we said before, one of the main advantages of um, the Stanford method is that it takes a lot of time and we can do live cell imaging. So uh, Gilad and his lab, they're interested in uh, T-cell receptors and the dynamics of T-cell receptors. And they had various different hypotheses about what this dynamics look like, but they weren't able to measure it ever in real time. And here what we did is we used this method of l sparkum in order to track uh, the, the dynamics in T-cell activation. And here you see the, the first results. Here you actually see a movie. So this is the movie that we got from their imaging devices. And here you see the movie after super resolution. And what's super cool is that here we actually did it without any training. So everything is learned because there is no ground truth. We had nothing to train it on. So again, because this is a lightweight interpretable system and it doesn't have a lot of parameters, we were able to do all of the training from the actual input. Okay, so we call this auto sparkum. Um, it's basically trained on patches from the input itself. It doesn't require any known training data. Okay, so those of you interested, we have a recent review that we wrote specifically on unrolling for biological imaging and super resolution. So you could take a look at that article, which goes into all of this in a little bit more detail. Okay, so all of this, of course, was 2D. The next step, obviously, is to extend this to 3D. Um, 3D, as you all know, turns out to be much more complicated than 2D. It's not just an added dimension, but we have, you know, the, the PSF changes along the Z dimension. So it makes the method uh, much more complicated. And of course, there's various types of 3D slicing that you can use. Um, but anyway, so I won't go here into all of the details. Um, the mathematics is a little bit more involved. We had to use regularizers that uh, were a little bit more sophisticated in the Z domain to overcome, you know, this issue of the, the PSF changing along the Z domain. But we were able to get kind of first results of applying Sparkum to 3D, which are very encouraging. And now we're looking at, again, doing the unfolding so that we don't have to use um, all of these hyperparameters. And another thing that we're incorporating into 3D um, which is which is very important, again, particularly because 3D is more challenging with that extra dimension, is we've incorporated self-attention networks. So those of you who are kind of following the deep learning literature, one of the kind of hot topics recently are transformers and, and self-attention, uh, which have shown great results in vision, but, but again, they're non-interpretable. But the nice thing is that transformers or self-attention are really based on correlations. And our method here are heavily based on correlation, right? The whole method was motivated by looking at correlation. So we could very nicely incorporate these self-attention models. And that gives us methods that have even better resolution and are also much simpler. So the network becomes uh, very, very simple to train. Finally, a more uh, recent application that we've been looking at, and this is done together with a group of Professor Dan uh, and, and Professor Eduardo uh, Charbin, um, and this is, of course, their expertise. I'm doing the more algorithmic side. The, the underlying uh, optics setup is, of course, theirs. But they've been very, very interested in SPAD arrays and single photon avalanche detectors, um, which, which is a really, I, I think, exciting uh, type of photosensors where they use only single photon detection. And these have just recently become commercially available, which allows really extreme sensitivity at the quantum level. Um, so it's it's really exciting to see that the results that they get. But still, there's a lot of challenges there on the algorithmic side, um, which of course have not yet been addressed since these devices are very, very new. And we're working now, we have a postdoc who's kind of, this is his focus, is using these learned Sparkum ideas um, on SPAD acquisition. And furthermore, we're kind of tailoring the acquisition to fit the type of 
recovery that we're doing based on uh, correlation. So this is kind of work in progress, um, but but so far we've been getting very exciting results. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a test, a taste of how we can use these ideas for microscopy. I, I just want to end, and I, I know kind of I should be leaving time for a Q&A, so just to take a few more minutes, and I, I'd like to end by showing how we can use these ideas also in clinical settings. So uh, microscopy is super important, and we've been working on it a lot, and I would say that's, you know, very useful for scientific purposes, um, uh, also for pathology in a more clinical setting. But we've been interested in how we can use this for imaging, let's say, using ultrasound. So we know that the problem of ultrasound, very much like optics, is that it's it's diffraction limited. So, you know, we can't see fine details. And um, what we've been doing in this study, and again, this is a clinical study done in Valenton Hospital, is we were trying to mimic what we do in microscopy. And we do that by injecting contrast agents that are FDA approved, so there's no problem in using them, into the body. These are basically gas microbubbles that, you know, go through the blood flow. And mathematically, they really are the same as the fluorophores, right? Because when I take an image in some plane, I'm seeing these microbubbles hitting the plane in random fashion, uh, just like the fluorophores. And then we use the same ideas that we use in microscopy for ultrasound. And um, it, just to keep in mind that using contrast agents in itself does not it does not help in terms of resolution. So here you see a standard ultrasound image of a, a breast lesion. So this is a lesion within the breast. And you see a lesion, but you can't see within it. And when we use contrast, it actually doesn't help. It just makes everything brighter, but it doesn't allow us to see within the lesion. Um, but after we use these model-based recovery techniques, we see that we could actually get super resolution. So here you see three different lesions of three different patients. And in the standard ultrasound machine, they actually look very similar. We see a black lesion, but we don't see within the lesion. But here you see those same images after using our model-based recovery, and we can see that these lesions are actually very different. So this is a benign lesion, and you can see that because it's very homogeneous. This is actually a cyst, and you can see that because the inside is filled with fluid. And this, unfortunately, is a, is a tumor, a malignant tumor, and you could see that because it's very non-homogeneous. Um, you know, the, the outskirts here is very non-regular, and we see that, you know, the, the blood vessels are, are very non-uniform throughout the lesion, and all of these are indicators of a malignant tumor. But if you look over here, they all look the same. So these ideas of fluorescence microscopy could be mimicked uh, within ultrasound imaging as well. Um, another area where we've been using this recently, and this is a collaboration we've been doing with the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard, is using these very same mathematical tools for imaging transcriptomics. So that's kind of one level beyond um, super resolution where we also want to see the spatial organization of gene expression. And this is done by basically inserting barcodes um, into, the, into the gene. So it's like using fluorophores, but each fluorophore has a spatial code that helps us do uh, spatial localization. And here we can use very similar ideas to Sparkum, just we have an extra code dimension. So it's the same idea of sparsity in the correlation domain, but we also have a known code. There's another axis here that has the known barcode. And this has enabled us, I, I, I'll skip the mathematical details because they're very similar to what we've seen before, uh, but we've applied this to MRFish data, which is, which is um, transcriptomic data. And we've seen that we could get even better resolution using a, a much smaller objective. Now, the reason that this is important is because if we can use a smaller objective, that, that means that the time that it takes to do the scan um, is, is much, much lower. And this is really uh, important because one of the main limitations of transcriptomics today is the throughput. Of course, also the resolution that you get, but also the throughput. So once we could increase resolution, we can either get better resolution at the same magnification or we can increase throughput, use a much lower magnification, which we could do much quicker and get um, the same or even better uh, classification results. So um, this is kind of very recent work. It's still unpublished on how we can use this also for trans transcriptomics. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm you know, basically on time. Uh, just very quickly, I'm just gonna end with uh, two slides on theory. So what we've shown until now is that we can use unfolding to solve various imaging problems in general and super resolution imaging problems in particular by exploiting the structure. I've said many, many times throughout the talk that you know this leads to better performance, we get better results from fewer training data, we generalize better, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we've seen that empirically, but the question is, 
you know, could we actually prove that? So if we see something consistently empirically, then, you know, we should hope to be able to prove it. And of course, proving anything in deep learning is very difficult. Um, so that's the same thing here as well. But we do have some beginning of theoretical results that prove that these methods are in fact uh, more robust than standard methods that are not model-based. So the first set of results that we were able to prove is to show that for these learned methods, we can actually generalize better. So for the same number of training samples, we could get a much better generalization error. And what's really, really nice is that until now, all of the results in learning, um, basically the bounds that you get say that the generalization error increases with the depth. And we know that's not true. We know that, you know, at least if we build the networks in an appropriate way, when we add more layers, the generalization error actually goes down, right, which is what we want. But none of the bounds today in learning capture that. And what we've able to show with these model-based approaches is that the generalization error is better, but it also decays as a function of the layers, which is the behavior that we expect and hope to see. So that's captured very nicely um, in these results on the model-based network. We can also develop results on the number of training samples that we need. So I keep on saying we could do very efficient training because we're model-based, but we, we are actually, actually be able to prove that for the sparse recovery methods where we could get a bound on the number of training samples that we need. And again, it's lower than we would have got in from non-model-based methods. So wrapping up, what I've tried to kind of get across today is how we can merge signal processing algorithms with machine learning tools. Um, we've seen that we can do that. We mainly focused here on the unfolding techniques. Uh, we've seen that it gives us much better performance with, from small training sets or even no training sets um, in many, many examples, it allows us to incorporate anything we know about the problem. It gives us very interpretable methods. Um, and we've also shown some of the beginning of the theoretical results um, that show all of this in practice. So those of you interested, we have a recent review that focuses on these methods um, in general. And there's much more data and results on my webpage. Um, I'd like to thank, of course, my amazing group of students that I've had the pleasure and honor to work with. Obviously, none of this would have been possible uh, without of them. And of course, my fantastic collaborators that I've been working with on these different projects. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm super happy to take questions.